Thank you, Boris. I don't have any specific disclosures myself. These are uh, some disclosures from my employer. So time and range is typically defined as uh, 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, 3.9 to 10 millimoles per liter. As our general rule, when we get into pregnancy and other situations, it may be different. It's important to recognize what will seem reasonably obvious, that it's really reflecting time in hyperglycemia. If we take a person with diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C of 8%, and on average, the time and range is going to be about 50%, of that 50%, 47% uh, of the day is going to be above 180 and 3% below, uh, below 70, not too different than what Earl just showed. So really, when we look at the time out of range, the 50% time out of range, more than 90% of that's going to be hyperglycemia. So it's not then surprising that time and range correlates with other CGM metrics, time above 180, area end of the curve, HBGI, or, or mean glucose with around 0.95 or for higher for most of those. So it's really when we talk about time and range, for the most part, we're talking about a metric of, of hyperglycemia. So this is a paper we published uh, in the JDST uh, uh, about a year ago, looking at relationship of time and range with hemoglobin A1C and other, and other metrics. And very similar to the slide that, that Earl showed, we see this uh, wide spread of possible A1C values for different time and ranges and vice versa for any given A1C, a wide, a wide range of uh, time and ranges. And you can see that on average the correlation, just the straight correlation between time and range and A1C is about 0.73. This is from a, a slide uh, presented a talk this morning by uh, Shiara Fabris from uh, University of Virginia who works with Dr. Kvachev. Showing again very similar discordance frequently between the uh, lab A1C and time and range and correlations of about 0.75 or 0.81. But what, we, what she did, which was presented in that, in that paper, was try to look at the explanation for the discrepancy. And other researchers have looked at this. And to a large extent, much of it seems like it could be explained by differences in red blood cell lifespan between individuals or something else that's, that's non-glycemic that's affecting, affecting that. So I'm not going to go into the model that was done, but in essence what was done is they corrected the time and range to make it more approximate to explain this discrepancy with the actual A1C. And when they do that, you can see how much tighter this distribution is with the red circle now representing the distribution and the correlation going from what was about 0.75 or 0.8 now to above 0.93. And just to show where it was before, before that uh, effect on the data was done with, with that equation, you can see what's in the blue and it tightened it down to the red. So again, our correlation improving dramatically. So basically, it kind of, in essence, proves the point that both hemoglobin A1C and time and range or mean glucose are essentially measuring, measuring the same thing. We're all familiar with the DCCT and also with this classic uh, relationship between hemoglobin A1C and complications that you see here with higher A1C related to uh, complication rates of retinopathy, neur neuropathy, or nephropathy. And the challenge has been is, although it seems logical, the answer to this question, just from what I just showed, because we have pretty convincing evidence that time and range and hemoglobin A1C are, are from a glycemic point, measuring the same thing, that this association by uh, by association would be strong with diabetic complications and, and time and range. But it kind of needs to be shown. The problem is, of course, that back in the DCCT, uh, there was not CGM, and we're at a stage now where it would really be impossible to repeat the, repeat the DCCT study with that. So we tried to look and doing something using the DCCT data, which just is such an unbelievable, amazing data set for looking at so many things. This is a paper published, Diabetes Care, and 2018 that we did where we tried to use the seven-point blood glucose measurement testing from time and range to, uh, from DCCT to compute time and range to then correlate it with outcomes. And so in DCCT, once every three months, there was seven capillary uh, tubes filled with blood by the participants on the schedule. It was sent to a central lab in Minnesota, and they measured uh, the glucose in those. 
And so that was done throughout the course of DCCT, and fundus photographs were taken for assessing retinopathy, and microalbuminuria was assessed from urine uh, to, assess, to assess renal function. So we took those data, and this was the completeness, really amazing completeness of the participants in that study doing these seven measurements on those does once, once every three months with 88% of all time points uh, represented, all seven measurements uh, obtained in three quarters of the cases. And then we used a, a, a computer, compu uh, statistical approach and used multiple imputation for the missing glucose values. And we computed these different metrics, the time and range and these other uh, metrics that are correlated with time and range and essence measures of hyperglycemia. Now we used a Cox proportional hazards model to assess the effect of time and range and the other metrics on the development of retinopathy or progression of retinopathy in microalbuminuria. And this is, this is what we found to start. So just comparing the DCCT intensive group to the conventional group, uh, the A1C difference, which is uh, well known and published, of 7.3 percent in the intensive group and the conventional group of 9.1 percent. When we look at time and range, we see along those lines uh, time and range difference of about 21 percent uh, difference between the intensive and conventional groups, and you can see the other, other metrics there. So just taking those seven points and accumulating them, we could see, you know, a reasonable separation similar to what we're seeing with, uh, with hemoglobin A1C. So then we took that time and range data, again, it's from seven measurements once every three months, and then looked at its relationship to, in this slide, development of retinopathy. And you can see as we go across from left to right, the time and range is decreasing from 70% or above on the left to less than 10% on the right, and we see a pretty substantial increase in the uh, progression of retinopathy as we go to lower time and range. And when that's put in the model, we see it equates with having an increase by 64% for each 10% percentage points lower time and range. If we look at five percentage points, it was a 28% uh, increase in retinopathy. So how does that compare with, DCC, or with uh, hemoglobin A1C? And so here we see hemoglobin A1C from uh, DCCT on the left and time and range on the right, and it looks remarkably similar in, in appearance uh, here. And then trying to equate what that means, you know, what we did, and we just did this uh, recently, was not in that paper. We said, well, what's the risk with a 0.5% uh, difference in, in hemoglobin A1C? We can see that the retinopathy progression rate increased by 32% for each 0.5% higher A1C, and also for 6.2 percentage point lower time and range. So a lower time and range by 6.2%, in essence, equated with a 0.5% higher A1C with respect to the increase in retinopathy progression. When we looked at microalbuminuria, we see a very similar uh, effect, not quite as strong. Here the uh, rate for development of microalbuminuria increased by 40% for each uh, 10 percentage points lower time and range. But then when we compare it with what was seen with hemoglobin A1C, it's very, very similar pattern higher A1C or lower time and range associated with substantially greater progression of, uh, of renal disease. So just to su summarize this, and we'll come back to this, you know, DCCT, again, seven, seven blood glucose measurements every three months, even with that little amount of data, we could see a strong association with vascular complications uh, of, of reasonably similar magnitude to what we saw with the hemoglobin A1C. And there have been a couple other studies recently in the last year or so have tried to take what data available with CGM, and there hasn't been very much to uh, compare with outcomes. This is one from China, again, published in uh, Diabetes Care a little over a year ago, done by Lu et al., where they had over 32,000 uh, patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, they had a Medtronic iPro that was used, so the CGM data here we're going to show is only three days of data. And then they had fundus photographs and, and uh, classified as either no retinopathy, mild, moderate, or what they called vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy, which combines severe non-proliferative and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. One thing that's kind of interesting when you dissect the data, so you see that the uh, hemoglobin A1C in this population is 8.9. And so what we've seen, and kind of if we... Uh, 
look at translate from what Earl showed, we think that should equate with uh, time and range maybe about 45%. So they actually, as a group, had a time and range of 67% in there. So how do we explain that when you have an A1C, over, which is measuring over two or three months, of 8.9% in time and range that's really discordant in the 60s, uh, which, as we saw from Earl's population, was associated more with an A1C of 7 or a little over 7. You know, the only explanation could be that those three days changed behavior, and they just had better control on those three days than they did over the rest of the three months. Irrespective of that, though, we see, you know, statistically a pretty strong association between the percent time and range when we go from no retinopathy to mild, moderate, or vision-threatening retinopathy of a gradual decrease as the severity of retinopathy gets greater. Looking at it a different way, the other way around, here it's dividing the uh, groups into time and range based on their quartiles, and we can see with the uh, bars representing vision-threatening th vision diabetic retinopathy that the uh, pr prevalence of, of vision-threatening retinopathy was greater with lower time and range. And it, as we get up to above 86%, there was still some there, but it, was, but, it was, but it was quite low. Another study done by that same group um, measured carotid intimate media thickness in this large population, over 2,000, with uh, type 2 diabetes. And you can see on the uh, right-hand side of the slide that the greater the time and range, the lower the prevalence of abnormal uh, carotid intimate media thickening, which the, the, the authors felt was a marker of macrovascular disease that was there. One other study looking at time and range and outcomes I wanted to mention was this is a nice review done by Helen Murphy combining a couple studies where uh, CGM was done in pregnancy and showing that for a 5% difference in time and range, there was quite a substantial association with, uh, with newborn complications of Large gestational, large for gestational age, neonatal hypoglycemia, and neonatal intensive care admission. So 5% on a percentage basis doesn't sound like that much, but it's about, about an hour a day. So clearly, we've seen 5% is an important amount of difference in time and rates related to, related to complications. Now, these studies, you know, as even I've mentioned as we went through, have, comp have limitations. DCCT was based on blood glucose measurements, not CGM. Only one day of seven measurements every three months, but needless to say, even with that little data, we saw a strong association. Uh, the Lu study from China was cross-sectional at one point in time. We really can't assess cause and effect, and in fact, those three days of CGM data don't seem representative necessarily based on the uh, hemoglobin and C, but nevertheless, we saw a strong association there as well. Earl mentioned this study, um, the Pearl study. So as, as he mentioned in the Pearl study, which uh, was a randomized trial funded by NIH that's looking at uh, whether all allopurinol can prevent or reduce progression of renal disease, there was uh, blinded CGM data collected with uh, Libra funded by uh, Helmsley to measure these metrics, uh, as uh, Earl showed with the uh, glycemic variability CV. But the key part of that is, is that going to be related to the development of complications? And that's analysis that's in progress, and my understanding is that uh, it uh, may be presented at, at ADA this year. And that's a study that's uh, important for trying to address this prospectively. There's another study that's going to look at that, the uh, DRCR retina network that uh, NIH funds that's coordinated by the Jabe Center is about to embark on a study looking at phenofibrate versus placebo in a randomized trial on progression of retinopathy in those who are starting with mild retinopathy, so it would be a group with early disease. And again, funded by Helmsley to collect CGM data uh, at intervals every three or six months to try to look over the course of that uh, study whether uh, CGM metrics are predictive of progression of retinopathy and how well that compares with hemoglobin A1C for that project, project, projection. So those studies will help elucidate more information on this topic. So to summarize, DCCT seven-point testing demonstrated time and range is strongly associated with vascular complication rates, uh, somewhat similar to what the pattern we see with hemoglobin A1C. Again, this is just one day of seven measurements every three months, uh, and we certainly might think that that 
association might be even stronger if we had CGM measured longitudinally with measurements every day. Cross-sectional study from China showed a similar association between time and range and retinopathy. And really, I think, knowing that with the, uh, with the analysis I showed from Virginia of just the close relationship of time and range to hemoglobin A1C, plus what's indirect data in a sense of how CGM measured time and range, or we had blood glucose measured time and range, uh, correlates with these outcomes. It's kind of time to come to the realization that this would be an important endpoint for clinical trials. Now, I, I, I want to just leave you with one final note, and this is kind of interesting. We talk about surrogate outcome measures. The surrogate outcome measure we use when we can't really get the true measure we want. And so when hemoglobin A1C was, uh, became the validated glycemic metric based largely on DCCT and then some other studies that followed, it was a surrogate for a measure of hyperglycemia. And why, why was it needed? Why was it incredibly valuable? It's because at that time we didn't have CGM. We didn't have a way to measure uh, glucose levels realistically on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. But now with CGM, we can actually get the actual glucose concentrations. So when we have CGM now, I think we really need to th rethink as an outcome, do we really still need a surrogate for that, which would be hemoglobin A1C? or whether we're getting all the information we really just need from, uh, from CGM, which would be, you know, my viewpoint on this.